We've entitled this message, Dramatic Signs of Two Removals. It's chapter four of Ezekiel. And as we look at the scope here, we see the scripture just above it, Amos 3, 7, that says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Ezekiel is a tremendous book, and I'm, I'm really excited about believing God to show us his secrets as we go through it. As he did in the day of Ezekiel for the children of Israel, as we see that. As the Lord shows the children of Israel that are obviously doomed for judgment unless they change their ways and come back to God in repentance and walk with him. That he shows them this with ample time, years before the judgment comes upon them, giving them sufficient time to make it right with him. So this book of Ezekiel of the prophecies of the Babylonian captivity leading all the way to the apocalypse, the tribulation and the kingdom period. The scope is ye shall know that I am the Lord, which is uh, spoken by the Lord, quoted in, in many chapters in the book of Ezekiel, over and over and over, ye shall know that I am the Lord. We know that every book in the Bible is revealing Jesus Christ. As the Father reveals his Son from Genesis right through Revelation. This one is, ye shall know that I am the Lord. As he puts this, this, awesome statement in the judgment warnings so that the people will know that it's just not some some uh, alteration of of uh, of weather or nature or something for them to go through some kind of trials or or a change in policies or whatever as they go through these trials, each one of them, as ye shall know that I am the Lord. But these are warnings before they, they actually experience them. And uh, this is a divine plan of God with three divisions and focus here. The first three chapters, Ezekiel is commissioned just like the Lord commissions us when he says, I was sent by the Father to give the word, I gave the word, and so send I you. Our purpose as we come to the Lord and we're built up by him and fortified by him is, is to uh, speak forth the word of God, be a witness of the Lord. So send I you, speaking God's word, not psychology, not someone's commentary, but God's word. And then the, the, the middle section of the focus is the judgment warnings divided into two. First is the warnings to Israel and the second is to the Gentiles. And in this particular thing, the Lord actually uses this to sanctify the obedient remnant that are living their faith without compromise. That's so important to know. He sanctifies the obedient. He says that in Hebrews 5.9. These people that are so uh, are, who are not concerned about eternal salvation because they think all they have to do is accept Christ and they're eternally saved no matter what they do. It says there that Christ is the author of eternal salvation 
to those who obey him. It doesn't say anything about accepting him or believing in him as the only thing we have to do. It's very pointed, very plain, so conspicuous. And I cite every one that is in this, this, this false doctrine of once saved, always saved, to read that. And don't try to tell people that that doesn't apply today, that Jesus Christ paid it all, so that one doesn't apply. The word of God applies today to you, to me, to everyone. We are not above the judgments of the Lord just because we accept Christ. These people are called the children of Israel. And they had the same false doctrine and idea, ideology, that they were safe simply because they were descendants of Abraham, who was the friend of God, and noted for his righteous obedience and believing in God. Praise the Lord. So this is what this is what the book of Ezekiel is emphasizing as we go through these dramatic um, and objective signs of judgment uh, beginning today, because we'll be beginning in chapter four. The third section of the divine plan is the day of the Lord, which is includes the tribulation period. It starts with the rapture. And uh, I don't, you know, it's, it's difficult for me. It's, it's to try to try to put an end to the kingdom because the only thing that, that I can find in the word that sees the end of, of the kingdom or when the kingdom is, is fulfilled is when Jesus delivers it back to the Father, but the kingdom doesn't stop. It's an eternal kingdom. And we are in it if we follow the Lord in his word. And it says that there God will be all in all. Praise God. What a marvelous, marvelous promise and reality. So that last section here is divided into the tribulation and the kingdom as we as portrayed to us in the book of Ezekiel, as it shows these signs here. Praise God. And also we need to know that the condition of Israel is a rebellious nation. The Lord says they're a rebellious nation. They're impudent children and they're stiff-hearted. These signs are telling about the judgments before they happen and also some of them after some of the judgments have been fulfilled. But the location of the people is, is Babylon. Ezekiel was carried off on the second deportation with that, with the uh, uh, Jewish people that were captured there by Nebuchadnezzar on his second siege, taken to Babylon and they're encamped there on Nebuchadnezzar's canal in Babylon. But the amazing part is they'll have Ezekiel, the prophet with them. Also, Jeremiah back home in Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar does not take. He leaves Jeremiah. That's the providence of God. He leaves Jeremiah to do with whatever he wants. Jeremiah was faithful for, for 40 years or more in bringing God's word as the Lord revealed it to him. And from all indications, it, it from at least from 
what we can see, he went through tremendous sorrow and grief because the, the people wouldn't and didn't receive his messages. The time here is the year BC, 592 BC to around 570 BC. All right, praise God. I have a chart here that is a summary of chapter four as we cover that, but first we want to read uh, chapter four. So read along with me. The Lord speaking to Ezekiel and he's commissioning him. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. So that you see that the Lord is taking a tile and asking him to use it as a, as a drawing board and he's gonna tell him how to draw this picture. This is a dramatic sign of the judgment of God. Verse two, and lay siege against it and build a fort against it, cast a mount against it, set the camp also against it and set battering rams against it round about. It's gonna show Jerusalem is under siege. A tremendous encounter with the Lord because of their disobedience and stiff-heartedness. Verse three, moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city and set thy face against it and it shall be besieged and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. So he's telling Ezekiel, Ezekiel has to be against the, the uh, stand against it, stand with God in his judgment against them. And this iron pan is to, that is separation, the sanctification of God's, of God's servant uh, from those that are disobedient. And he's to draw this on this drawing board. Now here is the dr drama part. Verse four, lie thou also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So he's telling Ezekiel that he has to lie on his uh, left side for 390 days, he has to show this uh, before the children of Israel. It's a visual uh, portrayal of this judgment. Verse six, and when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. 40 days, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Therefore, thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. So he's telling Ezekiel that he must go full speed ahead on this assignment and to be very faithful to uh, show that he himself as a servant of the Lord is in agreement with this judgment. And in, uh, this is not some nominal 
movie or picture or portrayal, but it's to be one that shows the definite sincerity of the Lord to carry out this judgment unless the people repent and turn to him. Behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. So remember, he's 390 days on his left side and 40 days on his right side. And now, this is another sign here. Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches and put them in one vessel and make thee bread thereof according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. 390 days shalt thou eat thereof. This is another sign to put with this. Tells him what to eat during this time for 390 days. And thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be by weight 20 shekels a day from time to time shalt thou eat it. That, that is about eight ounces. In, uh, in weight. So it's not a whole lot of food. And he's telling him what to eat, and he eat it from time to time during this 390 days. And of course, the 40 days as well. And thou shalt drink also water by measure, the sixth part of a hen. From time to time shalt thou drink. That's about a sixth of a gallon is what uh, the, uh, Ezekiel is to drink per day. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. He wants to make this a, the really uh, severe judgment. And the Lord said, even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. So this picture, this drama is going to lead to bondage among the Gentiles, what the Lord is going to drive them, and what they are to eat, well, what they will eat when they're there. Then said I, this is Ezekiel now speaking to the Lord. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been polluted. For from my youth up until now have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself or is torn in pieces. Neither came there abominable flesh in my mouth. Notice what the Lord says to Ezekiel. Then he said unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. Glory be to God. It shows the, the thoughtfulness of the Lord for his servant when his servant brings the petition that he didn't want to to follow through with anything that was going to be against uh, God's original instruction uh, to keep himself pure. He didn't want to eat anything that was, was cooked using man's dung as the fuel for the fire. So the Lord says, okay, you can use cow's dung. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord for the great God that we serve. Verse 16, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, 
Behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem. And they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment. That they may want bread and water and be astonished one with another and consume away for their iniquity. So this part of the judgment is, was actually followed through on the third deportation uh, and the siege rather of uh, roughly a year and a half, 18 months, a little short of two months and uh, two years anyway, when Nebuchadnezzar had Jerusalem surrounded, cut off their food supply and their water supply, and people were starving to death. They even started uh, committing the cannibalism because they had nothing to eat and uh, or to drink. So this is the warning that the Lord gives in this visual, very graphic sign and drama that Ezekiel is to carry out. So we'll go back to the notes. That's the chapter four. And we'll look at the breakdown of it. So we're going to see this sign is it talking about Israel, divided kingdom? That's what the Lord said. You're, you're lying on your left side for Israel for 390 days, carrying the judgment that is on Israel, 390 days. The divide, that, that is a, a definite sign. The Lord said that that'll be a sign. You'll be a sign for the children of Israel. That's a sign of the dividing the kingdom to the 70 year Babylonian captivity. Nebuchadnezzar, 390 years. I want to show you that. Here's a list of the kings showing from the divided kingdom. On the left over here, you see Judah, that's the southern two tribes, which is Benjamin and Judah. On the right, you see Israel, the northern 10 tribes, sometimes also referred to as Ephraim by the Lord and his word. This chart shows whether the king was good or bad, names the king, and shows the years of his reign, all the way down through the final king of Judah, which is Zedekiah. His original name is Mataniah, but Nebuchadnezzar changed it to Zedekiah as he himself put Zedekiah in charge of the people of Judah. Zedekiah, follow, Zedekiah followed the, the uh, uh, I, sh I should say he really didn't follow. He didn't follow uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, so Nebuchadnezzar came on the 11th year, actually the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, surrendered him and starved him out for uh, nearly two years there before he took them all, including Zedekiah, to Babylon. But Judah had some good kings, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, Jotham, Hezekiah, Josiah, the last really good king 
of Judah. The Lord allowed it to bring the word of God before the people and use jo Josiah to bring a revival for 13 years there in uh, uh, in in, uh, in Judah before actually 22 years before the removal. So this shows that adding up all those years of these kings amounts to 390 years. That's a sign of Israel's first removing. Because at the end of those years, 390 years, Hezekiah carried off the last few people, except Jeremiah and a few poor people, to Babylon. Here it shows the three the deportations. 606 BC, the first deportation, Daniel was left. Daniel, excuse me, not left, taken. That started the, the uh, 70 year uh, judgment when Daniel was taken. So they, they had Daniel in the king's court. Daniel went to the king's court. He didn't go. They didn't take him down to the Nebuchadnezzar's canal. In fact, they took him into the royal uh, court and, and endeavored to make a Chaldean out of him. But in Lord the Lord's providence, he wound up being in charge of the uh, soothsayers and the, and the false uh, teachers and things. He was over them, the magicians and so on. So he was there in the king's court. He never partook of their wickedness. He stood his ground. He prayed to the Lord three times every day. He was uh, thrown in the lion's den because he wouldn't worship uh, the image there of the king. Excuse me, he wouldn't. Uh, uh, the, that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but wouldn't bow to the to the image. The Lord will bring that to my memory, I'm sure. Anyway, the second deportation was in the year 597. They went to Nebuchadnezzar's canal, and that's when Ezekiel was taken, along with the scat, the craftsman, the skilled craftsman of Judah. But the last deportation was in the year 586 when King Zedekiah and the balance of the people were taken to Babylon amounting to 390 years the fulfillment when King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and deported Judah to Babylon. So the people had no city, they had no country, they had no temple in which to worship their God, and they were slaves by a foreign country, a Gentile country. And they were that way for 70 years before the year 536, which uh, we can read about in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, when they are given the uh, decree to go back. In the first year of this reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years wherewith the Lord the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet 
that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Remember, this is long before the judgment. The Lord revealed that to his people. That's, that's a, a confirmation of the fact that the Lord shows his prophets what he's going to do long before he does it for the benefit of the people. Praise the Lord. Now we look at Israel's side when he's, the, the divided kingdom, when it was divided was at the time of Solomon's death when Rehoboam, Solomon's son, refused to be kind to the people and um, said he was going to be harder on them than his father, Solomon. And so they had a civil war there with Jeroboam being the, the leader of the 10 tribes. He actually wasn't even a, a, an Israelite. But the Lord promised him that he would use him to deliver the people if he would follow them. But he didn't. And they have all bad kings all the time of their kingdom. And it's in the year of 721 BC that this group of people, the northern tribes, were overtaken by the Assyrians and carried off to Nineveh. By the time that Nebuchadnezzar took over, um, the first siege in uh, 606 of Judah, he had already overtaken Nineveh at the Battle of Karshemish and carried the people, the people who were there of the divided kingdom of the 10 tribes to Babylon. So all of these people wound up in Babylon, proving that there are no lost tribes. The Lord knows where they are, knows who they are, and that he's going to deliver them in the end time. Those that walk with him, the remnant. Praise the Lord. So there is the divided kingdom to the 70 year Babylonian captivity, 390 years. That's the sign. And on lie on the right side, 40 days is, is referring to Judah. Judah's uh, sin of 40 days, or uh, rather the display shown uh, representing that. What the, the fulfillment of that, the clock started ticking on that at the crucifixion of Christ. Roman crucifixion of Christ to the Jews being scattered throughout the world 40 years later. Judah is the line of Christ. Christ came from that line in Judah. From the crucifixion in AD 30 to uh, 70 this this is not AD excuse me I'm going to change that right now yes it is AD 30 to 70 is exactly 40 years now before we go into other charts to show you and explain it further, we look at this section here. They eat bread by weight 
20 shekels, the Lord said, is about eight ounces. The spiritual application of that is they lack spiritual food, not only physical food, but they want, they have want of, they have need of spiritual food, the word of God. The word of God is given to them all the way through the 390 years and the 40 years. But their refusal to heed to the call brings the judgment. So this was signs of famine. And the water dimension is one-sixth or six-tenths is better. Six-tenths of a gallon. And the spiritual application there is the lack or want of living water. Oh, how serious is it for us to take heed to the word of God and recognize the importance of the word of God in our lives. Because the Lord is closer than hands and feet. He's closer than, he sticks closer than a brother. He, he, the Lord is, is ever present in time of need. The Lord is the mighty God. He's the mighty savior. He's the deliverer. He's the comforter. He's the answerer of our prayers. He's our life. Without him, we do not have life. He is the answer. His word. He is the word. The Lord says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul, and all thy strength. And in John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. The word is our Lord. Israel is, is an example to us. And these things happen to them for our learning. To, to give us the opportunity to see the value of Christ and his word and the need of it. What was destroyed in both of these examples is that Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed both times both at the end of the Judean kingdom, 390 years, and 70 or 40 years after Christ was crucified, which was AD 70. The temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was destroyed. So again, Israel, all Israel, loses Jerusalem, which is which is a sign or or representing national, national Israel. They're, they're people without a country until 1948, when the Lord and his 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 providence allowed some of them to come back. And is still doing that today. But the coming back that the Lord promises in his word is in the future yet the fulfillment of the promise of the return of Israel as, as restored Israel, where the remnant come to know Christ as their Savior, is in the future. It's at the end of the tribulation period. During the tribulation period, they will be restored uh, by Christ who reveals himself to them. And at the end of the tribulation period, the Lord will call all Jews from all over the world and bring them into the kingdom so that they have opportunity to know him. How marvelous. So the representation here, Jerusalem represents the national part 
the temple represents the spiritual part. So the people of Israel are, uh, are in bondage, nationally and spiritually. So that's uh, the chart on that. So this shows the notes here, Israel's first removal. That's in Ezekiel 4, 1, 2, 5. We read that about the 390 years. Uh, and then the sign of Israel's first return, we find that in Isaiah. The Jews are allowed to return. That saith of Cyprus, Cyrus, excuse me. Speaking of Cyrus, King Cyrus, nearly 200 years before Isaiah is prophesying here that Cyrus is going to be the one that lets the people out of bondage. Thus, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Oh, praise the Lord for his word. The Lord stands behind his word. And he tells us way before what he's going to do. Jews were allowed to return in the year 536, which ended the 70-year bondage in Babylon by King Cyrus and was also prophesied by Isaiah 150 or 200 years earlier. Now the sign of Israel's second removal scattered throughout the world in AD 70. 40 years to the day from Christ's crucifixion to the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. It happened on the 14th day of Nisan, which is the very day that Christ was crucified. The very day that the Lord had the children of Israel in Egypt offer the first sacrifice uh, while they were in Egypt, which brings about the Passover, the last plague that the Lord brought upon Egypt, where anybody who didn't offer that sacrifice, their firstborn would be killed, and all Egypt lost, not only the people, but the animals the firstborn, but Israel didn't lose one. And they left Egypt. That was the delivery, the same day, Nisan 14. Praise the Lord. 40 years to the day. Now Israel's final return is also promising Jeremiah and Isaiah the final return meaning when the Lord will bring them back nationally and spiritually. It'll be a remnant, those who follow the Lord, those who love the Lord. Israel is saved in the tribulation and gathered by the Lord in the kingdom. Let's look at those verses.
and I will gather the remnant of my flock. Jeremiah 23, 3. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set shepherds over them which shall feed them and shall fear no more. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall I be lacking, saith the Lord. That is showing the final return of the Jewish people. Now Ezekiel in chapter 4 we read that about the 40 days that Ezekiel was lie on his the right side, carrying the iniquity of the Judean people. Uh, oh, yes. Now, also, you'll recognize this one in Isaiah 11. Speaking of the end time, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Those of you been following know exactly what this is. This is the restoring of the, uh, of bringing the Lord to restore uh, the kingdom uh, uh, the kingship on David's throne, the throne of David, meaning over the people of Israel. And that branch is Jesus. Verse two, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And I shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Oh, how we need this Jesus. Oh, glory to God. What a difference from our leaders today. This is the branch. This is the Lord. This is the righteous one. This is the one that will judge righteously. This is the one that won't, won't put up with treasonous acts and wickedness. Glory be to God. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf shall, oh, shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Some people think that we're in the time of the kingdom today. Have any of you seen these things happening today? Where is the lion and the leopard lying down together? Or the calf and the young lion? Or a little child leading them? And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. The cow and the bear. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. To be quite a change in the kingdom. Praise the Lord. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the ass. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Oh, 
Come, Lord Jesus. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall a Gentile seat, and his rest shall be glorious. Amen. We need to enter into that rest. Amen. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left. There it is. The remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Patros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea, which means all the Gentile nations. And he shall set up an ancient ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Look at verse 13. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart. Remember Ephraim is another name for the 10 tribes called Israel. And the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. They'll be united again. It won't be divided kingdom. Not in the Lord's kingdom. Praise God. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines. Toward the west, they shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shallot. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Amen. He tells, showed his prophet long before it's going to happen. Now, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 32, 36 through 40. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, here's another prophecy from the Lord speaking through Jeremiah. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, whereof ye, shall, ye say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger, and in my fury and my great wrath. And I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Praise the Lord. Now this is just showing 
the uh, 70 week period is showing that AD 30 or 30 AD, excuse me, is the time of Jesus uh, crucifixion and resurrection, by the way, that's the gospel. The crucifixion and the resurrection. Hallelujah. Prophesied uh, in, uh, in Daniel come going forth of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. Chapter 9 of Daniel to the time of the uh, Messiah. And then it says the Messiah is cut off. And from that time is seven times seven or 49 years to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. 62 times seven or 430 years to the crucifixion of Christ, the death of Christ, a total of 483 years. This showing that at AD 30, actually from 30 AD, when the church was uh, the inception of the church through the baptism of the Holy Spirit sent down by the Lord as he went to glory the last time to send the promised Holy Spirit that started the church. This time gap here shows we don't know how many years that's going to be. This is where you and I live right now in this time gap. It shows here the final seven years for the tribulation to the kingdom where the Jewish people will be restored in this time is still in the future. In the midpoint of the tribulation period, just like the other uh, judgments, the sacrifice and the oblation will stop. When the temple was destroyed in those other two deep, or, uh, judgments, they, they spiritually were lost. They had nothing. When they lost Jerusalem, they lost their homeland. They didn't even have a nation. The Antichrist is going to be here in the middle of this tribulation period. He'll set himself up as God, proclaim himself as God, and he will stop all sacrifice and oblation. The end of sins and the bringing in everlasting righteousness, of course, that's through that kingdom period uh, of a thousand years of the Lord's return. This, the main purpose of this is to show the, uh, the uh, authentic time of the Lord's death concerning that prophecy. That prophecy in right. And so in order to show that that was the day I put a chart. You you might have seen it before. I put together a final Passover week of Jesus Christ before his crucifixion or of his crucifixion. Remember the Jewish time and the Western time. The Jews start their day at 6 p.m. at night. And 
where we started at 12 midnight. So this is the countdown of the days. This shows that in AD 30, on March 31st, was the 10th day of Nisan, is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem triumphantly. And here's all the scriptures proving that right here. This Exodus shows that when, for the first time when it was prophesied, uh, it shows about the sacrifice. Excuse me. This is when the lamb, let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. The lamb that is chosen. This is the time when the lamb is presented but not chosen. Exodus 1, the children of Israel are there and the Lord speaks to Moses and Aaron. And they're in the land of Egypt and the Lord says, verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. That's in the month of Nisan. The Lord changed the calendar there the Nisan and now is considered the first month in the Jewish calendar. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month, tenth of Nisan, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their families, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. There it is. That's what happened. On March 31st, the Lord rode into, into Jerusalem. Four days later, on the 14th, He's crucified. At the day of preparation, all these scriptures here are showing uh, the, uh, prophesy of the prophecy of them. It's only going to take a minute. It's so important to see this. Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. See, the point of this whole thing is that the Lord had Zechariah prophesied that long before uh, the birth of Jesus and the death of Jesus. Remember Amos 3, 7. The Lord will do nothing except that he first shows it unto his prophets. This shows that the people of Israel there in Jerusalem when Christ rode in there should have known. Christ even says that. He said, you should have known. Oh, if you had only known. Now you are wasted, he says. Matthew 21, verse 1. And when they drew near unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, they sent, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her, loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto thee, you shall say, The Lord hath needed them, 
and straightway he will send them. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. We just read it, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the full of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set them thereon. And a great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. They knew he was the, the Messiah, the King. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God, and out of them that sold a and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold there. And he said to them, it's written, my house shall be called the house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. So this is, the point here is showing this is Jesus. This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. They should have known he was the Messiah. The crucifixion, we just read that verse six over here in Exodus where they kill it on that fourth day. And there again in In Leviticus 23, 4, and 5. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which he shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Praise the Lord. Now the Passover, John 19, 31, was Friday. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day. The, the King James uh, interpreters put that in parentheses so that we would know what they were saying right there. For the Sabbath day was a high day, and we'll see what that means in a moment. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. We know, of course, that Jesus was dead already so that they didn't break his legs, fulfilling the prophecy that none of his bones would be broken. So here we see that he came in on Sunday, on the 10th of Nisan. He's crucified on Thursday, the 14th. And the Passover, I Sabbath was the 15th. This is the Passover, which was a Sabbath. The first day shall be a Sabbath, and the last shall be a Sabbath. Saturday is the regular Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. In Matthew 28, 1, they say that the word Sabbath there in the Greek is plural. In the Greek, it says Sabbath, 
but it's actually meaning Sabbath or plural. Regardless, the scripture says this is a high Sabbath and Saturday is a regular Sabbath. So there's two Sabbaths right here. And then Sunday, the 17th, is when Christ arose. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking to the children of Israel, saying to them, when you come to the land which I've given to you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheep of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And you shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted of you for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when you have waved the sheep and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. But this is showing that this is the type of Jesus who is the first fruits from the dead. First Corinthians 15 20 through 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. What we just read in Leviticus. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For so as it and Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So this is showing the Christ as the first fruits from the dead. Praise God. Now I want to finish up quickly. You know what's so amazing? is uh, on this 17th day of Nisan, the day that Christ arose, our calendar was the 7th of April in the year AD 30. It was the same day that the ark landed in Noah's day on Mount Ararat, sat down on Mount Ararat. Wasn't going to float anymore. It sat down there. It took him 40 days or more before he got out of it as the uh, waters receded and the ground dried. But the, the, that same day is when the ark, they were delivered from the flood Glory be to God. Look at the significance there. And Israel, number 33, three through five. And they departed from Ramses in the first month and on the 15th day of the first month and on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with an high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. This is before the Lord changed that month. It's showing that they went out there on the Passover. But Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4 
is very significant here. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. The king of the day, the Christ arose from the dead. Now I'm not going to look this up, but Mordecai, you remember Mordecai? Uh, who raised Esther in the book of uh, Esther and Nehemiah. And, and he's the one that uh, was very instrumental with Esther in the deliverance of the Jewish people at that time. And after the one that was uh, referenced as uh, referring to the Antichrist, that, that, that man, Haman, that wanted all the Jews destroyed there in Persia, that uh, it came out by the providence of the Lord and, and the fourth foresight, yes, and foretelling of the Lord that Mordecai was raised up on that same day above everybody else. And in the end, he was right under the king uh, as uh, after that he was raised up uh, to delivered from the, from the uh, threat and the decree of death. Now, I've got this one more chart here because I want to show you that the crucifixion being on Thursday, as we showed you here, on the 14th of Nisan, in April 4th and 8030. If, if, it, if it was a Friday, it violates four scriptures. And those four scriptures are this. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's Matthew 12, 40. Three days and three nights. So starting over here at night, on Thursday, they're starting, excuse me, he was crucified at 3 p.m. He died at 3 p.m. And that's three hours before uh, Friday. So it was Thursday was the first day, Friday the second day, Saturday the third day, and he rose on the, on the the next day, the fourth day, because of the Jewish calendar. That if, if it was a Friday like we celebrate, it would violate these particular scriptures. We remember that that deceiver, this is when they went to the king, or Herod, I mean to uh, Pilate, and said, he, he was yet alive after that three days, I will rise again. That's when they want to destroy Christ on the cross, uh, make sure that he's dead, and Pilate wouldn't do it. And he began, the next is, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. That's Mark 8.31. So on the road to Emmaus, 
as these two disciples are walking with Christ and not recognizing it's him, they're saying, we trusted that it had been he which should have been, had redeemed Israel. And besides all of this, today is the third day since these things were done. Luke 24, 21. So this proves uh, by going by the scriptures the interpretation that we just showed you. This is a record here of AD 70 taken by uh, Jerusalem taken by Titus of Rome and a temple was burned. Moreover, the siege of Jerusalem was begun on the 14th of Nisan, AD 70. This was 40 years to the very day from the 14th Nisan, AD 30 crucifixion. Now here's a record of the Jewish writings. The Jerusalem is a, a writing of the Jews. And the Babylonian are Talmuds saying that every night for 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the middle or chief light on the golden candlestick would simply go out and that the great brass temple gates, which were closed each evening, swung open each night of their own accord. Josephus tells us these doors were so massive that it took 20 men to close them. This is, this is Gentile records. Anyway, in closing here, the scope of Ezekiel, you shall know that I am the Lord. There's no doubt in our study today through the scriptures of his accurateness his, his uh, thoroughness, me talking of the Lord, and revealing to us what he's going to do before he does it, and that there's no excuse for missing out on his marvelous deliverances that he has for everyone who fall in love with him and follow him. The scope of Ezekiel is, you shall know that I am the Lord, and of course, of the entire Bible, the Father is revealing his Son, Jesus Christ. Let me give you two scriptures here in, in quick. Just one verse here. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, meaning Jesus, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Notice that, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. This is when they were on the road to Emmaus that we just alluded to a minute ago. Jesus is bringing all the scriptures, beginning at Moses, going through all the prophets, telling them the things that are concerning himself. Now, in verse 44 and 45, Jesus is speaking, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. There again, look at that. While I was yet with you, that all the things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Oh, what a wonderful God we serve.
I would say to you in closing before I pray that God wants you hungry for him. He wants you hungry for his word. I remember when I first got saved because I didn't have anybody helping me. I wasn't in church. There was no pastor or a friend leading me. I was just came to the end of myself, the end of my road, the end of my rope. And I knelt and prayed. And the Lord changed my life so much right there. The earth didn't shake and the lights didn't flash, but I was different. Immediately, I was different. And he placed in me a hunger for the word of God. And he dealt with me all the way through because I was so ignorant and everything but hungry for him. I made a few bump, speed bumps and things like that, but he led me all the way because I was hungry for the word. Hungry for the word. Hungry for the word. Glory be to God. Let's pray. Father, we pray for our country, our people, our schools, our governments. We pray for these things, Father God, for your divine intervention, for your deliverance, deliver us from evil, the divine is the kingdom. We know, Lord, that it's got to be coming back to the world. It's got to be to, through the world. Anything else short of that is, if it happens, would only be a band-aid on a terrible sore. Father God, in this hour of great evil, gross evil, wickedness, so terrible, it just, it's just terrible to even think about the things that you hear that are happening. And the, the, the direction that our world is going, our country is going, what's happening to us. There has to be a return to the word. Lord, I, I plead for you to bring the word back. Lord, you make a voice out of people like me. My influence seems to be so small. But Father God, in this end time, Will you bring a revival? In this end time, will you bring a revival of your word? Will you show your mercy like you have in the past? Like you did with Josiah when he caused all the countries around him to at least follow you in the rituals of the word. Oh God, bring us back to you. Save us, Lord, we need you. Save our lands. Heal us of our evils and our backslides. I love you, Lord. Thank you so much for the message today and let it, let the scriptures that were given and the, the message itself about you bring judgment upon those who refuse to follow you. Even by bringing us into bondage by a pagan country that may be just as bad, if not worse, than we are. But then you judge those people. You judge righteously. You judge those people about the way they treat us. You are perfect. There is no one like you. 
Lord, I love you and I praise you. Pray for fruit for our labors here, Lord, as we bring forth the word of God. And thank you for what you're doing in Brother Tom's life. We've given him fruit for his labor. You're spreading the word in Rwanda. And it's taking root in the lives of people. That's the book of Acts all over again. Thank you, Lord. We praise you and worship.